Welcome to Connect with Rohan de Alvis, brought to you by Satyajit Creations in London. Sri Lanka has been in both national and international news media as a country in crisis and severe economic crisis where it has run out of its foreign reserves, namely American dollars or US dollars. And the IMF has been uh, in Sri Lanka on two occasions. They are currently in Sri Lanka. Within a span of three months, they have been to Sri Lanka twice. Uh, I would like to understand the situation for the benefit of our viewers uh, with a brief history, how we got here, and what we are experiencing currently, and what happens next. I have an expert today to talk about this, and he needs no introduction. He is a highly regarded and a very well respected former governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He is none other than Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. Indrajit, very warm welcome to the program. Could you tell us about a little bit about the brief history, what led to the culmination of the economic crisis? and a little bit about from there what led to the uh, run on our foreign reserves which has brought a economic and a social crisis where we haven't got enough us dollars to buy essential foodstuffs fuel medicines and other items thank you rohan for having me on the program it's my pleasure. A great pleasure to be with you um the, as for the crisis i think it's fair to say that the crisis has been in the making for several decades. Uh, Sri Lanka has been what is known as a twin deficit country for many years now. Uh, the twin deficits relate to the budget, the government's fiscal operations, and what they call the current account of the balance of payments. It, and there the basic imbalance is in the trade account. Our imports are far greater than our exports. Um, so this problem, as I said, has been in the making for many years. Our policy framework has really not been suitable for economic transformation. Uh, we have had a rather toxic combination of populist uh, policy, economic policies and an entrenched entitlement culture amongst the people. And these two have fed off each other for us to have the kind of regression that we've had since independence. At independence, Sri Lanka was second to Japan on most socioeconomic indicators in Asia. We are now well down the list. And of course, there are, it is complex causality. There are social factors, uh, political factors, uh, cultural factors, or lots of things come, come into the, to the uh, kind of picture. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the biggest challenge has been this, what I call macroeconomic stress. And the primary cause for that macroeconomic stress has been the government's fiscal operation, its budgetary operations. Now, Sri Lanka, you can characterize Sri Lanka as a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, an overvalued and volatile exchange rate country. And that characterization is diametrically the opposite to countries in East and Southeast Asia, which have enjoyed far greater success than ours. And, and the underlying driver of that character, character, caricaturization has been the government's fiscal operations. The large budget deficits have pumped excess aggregate demand into the system, which has caused these other problems. So first thing we need to do is to get the fiscal, um, our fiscal house in order. And it's also fair to say, from a central banking perspective, for much of the time, the fiscal um, indiscipline has been amplified, at least the ramifications of the fiscal indiscipline has been amplified by what we call fiscal forbearance in monetary policy. The central bank's job is stability, mm. stable economic and price stability and stability of the financial system. However, in our case, often politics has interfered in the technical decision making of the central bank and whereby the central bank's policies have been designed to print money for the government or to have financial repression whereby we artificially keep interest rates down. When we artificially keep interest rates down, it inevitably, eventually leads to inflation and it creates demand, 
also in the system, which A, it creates uh, inflation, and B, some of that demand leaks into imports and causes balance of payments pressure, and that in turn leads pressure on the currency. So all this kind of stems from the government's fiscal operations, and the central bank needs greater independence to make sure that it, uh, politics doesn't interfere with its technical decision making, mm. and that it makes decision in such a way. Now, for instance, if the government has not kind of pursued sufficient fiscal prudence, then it's the job of the central bank to lean into that mm. by raising interest rates to compensate for for the uh, for the uh, indiscipline of the government. But in our situation, governments are not very keen and don't tolerate it and force the central bank not to have the appropriate policies. Mm. And this, as I said, amplifies the problem. So this has been going on for some time. And but most recently, the problems have been again, uh, the magnitude of the problem has increased, partly because of the pandemic, or I would say to a significant extent because of the pandemic. The Ukraine war has also the, if, uh, the effect of the Ukraine war is another factor. And if we are honest, we have made some large policy mistakes, the tax cuts being one. Um, and also uh, the fact that we uh, uh, banned fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, is another. These were two large policy mistakes which have added to the problem. And so what has happened is that in, and, and we got downgraded because of the kind of weak, weakening of the macro fundamentals following uh, the, the partly the domestic policies and partly because of the international circumstances, um, our economic outcomes deteriorated to the point where we got downgraded. We couldn't raise money uh, to, to pay our debts and uh, we had to do it out of our reserves. Mm. We had a rapid depletion of our reserves and that brought us to the situation we're I in see. now. I see. So we have been as a nation living beyond our means, not in the just last few years, but I suppose since independence or maybe since the 1970s. So living beyond our means, then there are world factors geopolitics, like a war in Ukraine, the coronavirus, uh, a global pandemic. And of course, I would say to you that these are all common to the rest of the world as well. It's not typical or special uh, to Sri Lanka, but other countries also have struggled, namely countries like Lebanon. However, the rest of the world has sort of dealt with the world, the, the, the world problems. Uh, uh, pandemics and so on. So is there something that's missing in a non-independent central bank? I mean, you mentioned living beyond our means as a nation and then the central banks of Sri Lanka, in this case, the role to raise or decrease, increase or decrease interest rates. So, I mean, for example, in the UK, we have an independent central bank. I think in Singapore, there is not even a, it's, it's a fiscal monetary mm -hmm. board. Uh, how would, well, firstly, I would like to know from you whether the Central Bank of Sri Lanka is an independent body today as it stands. We're not talking politics here, the status quo. Uh, and by making it an independent central bank, would that have created a, a bigger uh, 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 an effect where we would have negated some of these aspects? Uh, I would say that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka is not as independent as it should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, the, the level of independence goes up and down. Mm -hmm. um, in the time I was in the central bank, the monetary board was very keen that certainly when it came to policy making, that we would be driven only by the technical considerations and mm -hmm. that we would not be swayed by any politics. Um, but uh, that hasn't always been the case. Mm -hmm. um, now, for instance, I'll tell you one possible instance. Now, we've had... We had the tax cuts, and once the um, tax cuts took effect and the budget deficit uh, expanded and the need for government financing uh, increased because something had to make up for the tax revenue, and, and we didn't have access to markets because we had been downgraded. Yeah. So we had to then, the central bank was forced to print large amounts of money. I see. Because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to pay salaries and mm -hmm. pensions. Mm -hmm. Uh, you won't have been able to deliver some of the basic services. Mm. So the central bank had no choice but to 
print very large amounts of money. And the most detrimental, what they call high-powered money printing, is when the central bank buys treasury bills, government treasury bills in the primary market. It's basically just yeah, creating money for the government. And that, despite so-called modern monetary theory, that does create inflation. And it creates demand, which then leaks into imports, as I said earlier, and brings about a balance of payments problem. And that, in turn, then eventually puts pressure on, on the currency. Now, what would have been interesting is there was a bill, uh, which in, in the central bank bills, central bank of Sri Lanka bill, which was tabled in parliament in November 2019. Um, it didn't have enough parliamentary time to get enacted. And in that bill, there was a proposal to prevent the central bank from participating in the primary auction of the uh, of gov of tre government treasury bill. That is there in lots of other countries where the other central banks are not allowed to do this because, as I said, this is high-powered money printing. Mm -hmm. In our case, the central bank is allowed to do it at present. The bill was intended to stop that. It would have been interesting if that bill, there was enough time to get that bill through parliament, whether things would have transpired in the way they have because if the government knew that it couldn't just sell treasury bills to the, the central bank, the question then can be posed whether those tax cuts would have been effective. Mm. And that then history may have unfolded in a very different way. Mm. I see. So that, that's that's an important point or the number of points that you explained that's uh, uh, very clearly understood. So you also referred to debt. Mm. I mean, uh, I, as I understand it, there are three types of debt at least the government of Sri Lanka owes. Could you explain to us what these types of debts are yeah as well please so so there is first you have the distinction between domestic debt mm -hmm. and foreign debt i see we're talking the foreign foreign debt, debt yes so foreign debt comes in different forms one is bilateral debt mm -hmm. uh, which is from other partner development partner countries mm -hmm. so it's country to country country to country to, as the word implies bilateral. Exactly. bilateral then you have multilateral debt Mm -hmm. which is debt incurred from the multilateral agencies like the World Bank, yeah. like the ADB. Yeah. And the IMF is also is not quite a development agency. It's a monetary agency. But it is, again, uh, uh, that also falls under, I guess, multilateral debt. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is international commercial debt, of which the most important are international sovereign bonds. ISBs. Which account, the ISBs, which account for a very large component of our external debt. They, are, they amount to, at present, I think about 13 and a half, little over 13 billion US dollars. So 13 and a half or little over 13 billion, billion US dollars. That's the international sovereign bond or the bond ISB debt. That's right. So the, the, the remainder of the debt or the, what's the overall debt situation in Sri Lanka? I mean, I hear things, figures like 50 million, billion. That's, right. That's that rough. That? It's roughly that. It, it's, if you count only the central government debt, I, I, I believe it's about 51 billion. 51 if you, billion. If you count the debt owed by state-owned enterprises, it goes up by 5, 6 billion more. I see. So 56, 57 or 51, depending on the definition. So let's, let's go with approximately 50 billion or yeah. 51 billion overall debt situation, yeah. of which about, did you say 13? 13, 13, little over 13. Little over 13 billion is the issue or the problem here, the international sovereign bonds. Yeah. So the... Let's talk about the, come to the ISBs a little bit uh, later. Okay. So the, the multilateral debt, which is what I, in my mind, you can explain from an economic standpoint much better, but in my mind, it is the long-term uh, infrastructure development, like the money spent in the past on the Mahavali development, beyond that, the Laksapana hydroelectricity, well, in the 60s or the 50s, uh, and so on. Uh, so... Those, are we still repaying those? Are we still mm -hmm. keeping uh, those multilateral debts serviced? Yeah. Yes, we are. You cannot actually reschedule or restructure multilateral debt. Mm -hmm. Because then your relations, your in arrears and your relationship with those organizations is basically ended. Yeah. Or suspended, yeah. you should say. Uh, and no country can afford to do that. For instance, the IMF wouldn't help us if they're in arrears. Yeah. Uh, so that that debt is still being being uh, serviced. I should say one thing wrong. Mm. 
on bilateral debt for many years we were a low income country yes and we got very very concessional money mm -hmm. from bilateral sources we got oda official development assistance mm -hmm. um, from the multilateral agencies we got support from their concessional windows mm -hmm. the international development agency of the world bank ida or the asian development fund of the uh, of the asian development bank yeah. now both bilateral and multilateral debt when we were a low income country came on highly concessional terms we are talking now about particularly the multilateral debt of 10 year uh, uh, grace periods mm -hmm. 40 to 50 year maturity and interest rates of not much more than 1% I see. So, so it's very, very long term, 40 or 50 years. Very and you have cheap. The grace period of even 10 yeah, years. Yeah, and, and very about cheap. 1%. Very cheap. Very and, cheap. And, and this was the terms given by the multilaterals in particular. And about 60, 65% of our assistance came from those two institutions mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. But so the important thing to remember uh, is that we, had, we got all that concessional money I described mm -hmm. when we were a low income country. Mm -hmm. Now we started to graduate to middle income country status around 2008-9, and as we did that, initially we got blended money, mm -hmm. partly concessional, partly commercial. Yeah. Then we moved further up, and we lost access to concessional money. Now, when you are dependent on commercial money, that imposes a lot of discipline mm -hmm. because you have to have a your rating has to be sufficiently high to be able to access that money. and also uh, international uh, commercial lenders are actually far more uh, far tougher and more more kind of uh, determined to make sure that the fundamentals are good than even the imf mm. so you have you moved to a different paradigm mm. when you become a middle income country which is exposed to international capital markets and rating agencies so we go out into the market and borrow money borrow from money. commercial lenders exactly because we are no longer getting enough official money yeah. uh, to to meet our requirements for imports and for debt servicing so we have to go out and borrow money to meet those meet those requirements now the the where i think we went wrong is that we didn't absorb the implications of that graduation to middle income country status we carried on as usual you know which that we tend to do uh, and you know we the di discipline that is required you, you move to a different order of discipline mm. when you become a middle income country and you're exposed mm. to capital markets and mm. rating agencies mm. we did not really respond to that is that we carried on behaving in the same old way yeah yeah is that the fault of the government or the politicians as well as or or the bureaucrats or a mixture of both uh, well i mean to be honest uh I, we tried to point this out if you listen to my speeches i always talk about three paradigm shifts I have, I have. and one yes. of this is going into you know being exposed to rating agents and capital markets exactly i think i made myself sick saying this all, over and over again but i don't think it had any impact to be honest yeah. well i think that that's the problem with balancing what the uh, officials or the bureaucracy or the uh, official them states which is more or less correct most of the time and then uh, the politicians how they react and yeah. respond yeah. because they have a different base to answer to and exactly. that's the uh, exactly. entitlement culture yeah. or get something for yeah. nothing yeah. to get you know the vote it's easy of course for me to sit here and say this but much tougher <laughs> for for a politician for a politician yeah. who is yeah. answerable but, to but, the people but but we have to make that transition at least now otherwise we don't get out of this problem yeah. i mean we we are in deep economic trouble at the, at this point in time or perhaps since about january of this year uh we gone to the imf uh, for talks for a long time we resisted going to the imf but eventually we did go and a visit a team came uh, over to sri lanka they went back now back again they are on the ground in sri lanka i think they came on the 24th of august till the 31st now i know you're part of a, a, a expert team advising sri lanka as well um basically what would be the outcome not necessarily the outcome of these current talks but in general i'm talking so i mean the way i understand it is that there will be a staff which these negotiations will lead to a staff level agreement thereafter to an extended funding facility as i believe that is the case could you tell us a little bit about not specifics but in general 
where we are today and what it will lead to in the short to medium term. I'm talking end of this year or perhaps the first quarter of next year. So, uh, you know, obviously, I don't know the inside no, story no, or the sure. details of it, um, but I'm hoping that we can be cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. My understanding, listening to what the president has said, listen to what the governor has said, um, Governor Nandala Singh, uh, that we have made progress. Mm -hmm. uh, we have made pretty significant progress towards achieving staff level agreement. What staff level agreement means is that the policy content of the extended fund facility has been largely agreed on, mm -hmm. right? So that is the policy content. I see. Uh, so that hopefully by next Wednesday uh, or shortly after that, um, the IMF will be able to announce that uh, they have reached staff level agreement with the national authorities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work has been done. And, and I think the when the president makes his uh, mini budget uh, statement uh, in parliament, I think it's on the 30th, the 29th or 30th, I can't remember now. Uh, that I think will again incorporate some of the measures that uh, we have agreed to undertake. Um, and with that, hopefully we'll reach staff level agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but there is another very big component. Uh, normally, if you, once you reach staff level agreement, in a matter of weeks, you can go to the full facility. I see. And the IMF will start disbursing money. Mm -hmm. But in our case, because the IMF has deemed our debt unsustainable, yeah. we cannot move to disbursement of money that is executive board approval of our program and disbursement of money until the IMF is satisfied that we have sufficient assurance of financing to make our debt sustainable. Mm. So we have to one, one have, have basically a scenario as to how the debt will become uh, sustainable uh, and that we should have sufficient uh, uh, assurances of financing to make that scenario realistic. So that is to get the, 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 the 3 billion US dollars. Yes, that is to get staff level, that is to get executive board approval mm -hmm. uh, of the extended fund facility. I see. So you have to go from the staff level agreement to the, uh, to the uh, executive board approval. Normally not difficult and done pretty quickly. But if, if you're a country where your debt has been deemed to be unsustainable, mm -hmm. more complex, you have to, you know, as I said, come up with a scenario which uh, demonstrates that you will reach staff level agreement. And you normally do that with the help of debt advisors. Mm -hmm. Lazard and Clifford Chance are advising the government of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. you, you achieve that. You, so you come up with a scenario and then you have to talk to the creditors with this, with this scenario. And you have to have reasonable, as I said, you have to have reassurance mm -hmm. of sufficient financing that would be made available through the restructuring mm -hmm. so that then the ex executive board is satisfied that the debt is on about to become sustainable and they can then release the money, they approve the program and release the money. And I'm not here asking you to predict looking at a crystal ball here, but what sort of time frame do you feel? And it, your guess is perhaps more, much better than mine here, but it's still a guess to get to that situation. Yeah. Because we, we, I mean, uh, the way I see it is we have a huge unsustainable debt and we need to convert that with proposals and practical aspects to make it sustainable. That's a Herculean task in my mind. Yeah. Maybe it's not so. Uh, it is, it and is. how long will that take for the IMF to accept it and to get the three billion US dollars? Coming up with a scenario which will reduce the onerousness of the debt servicing. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, then that has cost for the, the creditors. Yeah. Then you have to work out how the burden is going to be shared amongst the creditors. Mm. And you have to get agreement from the creditors to bear that burden. So all that has to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. So just to interrupt you there, Indrajit, the creditors you are referring to are the London Club or, or well, the Paris? The, for us, it's still we have a lot of Paris Club there. 
right. uh, which, which is the commercial lending. Uh, no, the no. Paris Club is the bilateral, bilateral lending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we have also the London Club, the commercial, you know, commercial. basically mainly ISBs, yes. but one or two, I think, uh, bank loans. So when the Sri Lankan government, with their advisors, talk to the creditors, who do they talk to, the ISB holders exclusively or the ISB plus the bilaterals together? No, you first would talk to one or the other. Right. Uh, generally, I think you talk to the bilateral creditors. Uh, the assumption is the bilateral creditors may be somewhat more flexible and generous, mm. hopefully. Mm. Uh, and then, once you've got the terms agreed um, uh, with them, or at least you have go towards agreement, you can then go and talk to the, to the commercial creditors. Uh, and they usually form themselves into committees. The yes. ISB holders normally sort of form themselves into committees. They are already the committee, I think. Um, BlackRock, Ashmore, and them are part of that committee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then you negotiate with that committee. And, and, and normally the debt advisor would do that on behalf of the authorities. Yeah, I see. So that, that's why we have a, already appointed external Lazard, advisors, yeah. Lazards. And, uh, so a controversial question, a difficult one, uh, certainly a hypothetical question from me, perhaps, and a hypothetical answer. What happens if we simply tell the ISP holders we're not going to pay any monies back? <laughs> that, it's a difficult one. Yeah. That's why it's hypothetical. So, so, you know, we hope to become a middle-income country, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I mean, to retain our middle-income country, I think probably we will get reverse graduation. I suspect that is unavoidable. Right. And go back to low, a low-income low, country status, which, which temporarily could be a good thing because yes. we'll get more concessional Absolutely. money. Yeah. Uh, but the volume of money available becomes less because yes. then you are bound by the aid budgets of the bilateral uh, uh, partners and by the, the, the concessional windows, the amount of money available through the concessional windows of the World Bank and the ADB. Mm -hmm. And those monies are much smaller than what you can get mm -hmm. from the non-concessional mm -hmm. windows of the multilaterals. And of course, you are shut out from the, uh, from the international sure. capital markets. Uh, so the thing is, our level of savings is not sufficiently high, and very few countries are in such a position mm -hmm. where you can manage without some form of external borrowing. Commercial. So what you're doing is you you essentially, you know, your savings are the, what funds funds your investment, mm -hmm. and in the end, development is about investment increasing productivity, right? That mm -hmm. is that is what the essence of development is. That mm -hmm. so you have to have sufficiently high investment in physical infrastructure. You have to have sufficiently high investment in human resource development. Mm -hmm. So usually countries and certainly Sri Lanka too doesn't have sufficient savings to be able to fund the level of investment required for transformation of progress uh, on the economic front. Mm -hmm. So all countries, you know, from the U.S. to the, you know, any country in the world, borrows uh, money externally to supplement its domestic or national savings. Mm -hmm. So we need to have as large a pool as possible to access that. Um, it's better to do that. Uh, and uh, if we if we uh, go back to low income country status, we might be able to get uh, more concessional money. But I suspect the envelope of resources available to support our development will be less. I see. So that, that's the, the reason I asked this question from you is because there is a, a num there are a number of people in Sri Lanka talking about walking away. And it's just not 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 the mainstream mm -hmm. of not not paying the debt at all and working on the basis that we can continue uh, to uh, fund the economy through exports, etc. I think that that's not necessarily the right way forward because internationally we have to deal with uh, international organizations, whether we like them or not, that's irrelevant. Now, I, I hear... Let me just say one thing yes, about that. Yes, yes, of course. Is, is very now, about de developing exports all on our own. Mm. Now, if you are a country, just look at what has happened empirically in, mm. in the world. China, massive export transformation. Yes. Driven to a large extent by foreign capital, right? Indeed. FDIs. FDIs. Right. Um, 
even a small country like Singapore need an FDI. So you need access to foreign savings of some sort. Yeah. Right? Now, we have had a challenge in terms of attracting FDI. Mm. Because normally FDI goes after well, two things. One is it goes after a domestic market. There's a very large domestic market. Or it goes after efficiency. Mm. Right? Very efficient production facility. Now, we don't have either at the moment. And to get, we are never going to have a very large market. I mean, you know, uh, we are 22 million people. Yeah. We will, can get super efficiency like a Singapore, but that is going to take us a long time. Mm. So this transition will take a much longer if we don't have access to foreign savings. I see. And if, and if we don't have, I mean, we can make ourselves more attractive. We can certainly get more FDI. But because of this limitation in terms of the domestic market and the progress we still have to make to get our efficiency up is such and it's going to take time. And in that time, if we want to still make progress, we will need to have access to foreign savings through an instrument other than FDI. I see. So if we have the kind of uh, in, uh, macroeconomic uh, fundamentals that enables us to access international capital markets, in addition to what we can get from our bilateral and multilateral partners, then we can expedite the process, right? If you cut yourselves off from markets completely, you essentially, what you're doing is reducing the funds available for development. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for clarifying that very important point because of the, 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 the chatter that I hear from certain elements in Sri Lanka that we should really walk away from uh, cut off all ties. Now that will not work because as you say, uh, the FDI and also the uh, ability for us to go and market our products, etc. We need access to international markets. We need to be acceptable to uh, the rest of the world. So it's very important and I'm really grateful. And, and, and there is an image issue. You know, if, if you, if you, um, that is important. Yeah, you know, absolutely. whether we like it or not in our personal life, as well in our as national as life, in any, uh, sadly, image is important. Image is important. The reputation is important. Exactly. So on that point, we have been to the IMF for 16 times, and this is the 17th time. And I correct me if I'm wrong. On I think on nine occasions we have uh, not carried out the contractual obligations of the IMF. So it's a bit like a individual having borrowed 16 times from a bank, and on nine occasions he hasn't kept to the bank's promises. Uh, would that create some form of a prejudgment? Of Sri Lanka's case, because here is a country has yeah. gone to gone come to gone to the IMF sixteen times on nine occasions. We have sort of not defaulted, but breached some of the conditions. Uh, and so that's the first question. The next question is: um, Once we get the three billion, what happens next? Because we really need. If you have fifteen billion debt, we get three billion into our coffers. Where do we go from there? I think those are the two points that I want to clarify. So, you know, as far as not having completed all the IMF programs, mm. we are not the only country oh, that has done that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, and, but I, I must also make very clear that whatever money we have actually borrowed, whatever money the IMF has dispersed, we have been absolutely up to date in repaying. Mm -hmm. Right? We may not have kept to the policy conditions, yeah. but we have. You know, what we borrowed, we have repaid and we are up to date on that, right? right? So that, that is a very... So there is no problem. There is there. no problem there and we must be very clear about that. Good. But but on the policies, we tend, you know, IMF programs essentially have a... They focus on stabilizing the economy. Mm -hmm. So you have fiscal measures, you have monetary measures and you have some external measures. Very few structural measures mm -hmm. um, except those that directly impinge on macro uh, issues, like the SOE performance. If the SOEs are a drain on the budget, etc., then they get interested. I see. But otherwise, you know, they're not interested in what you're doing on education, what you're doing uh, in, in terms of your uh, investment climate, your factor markets. Those are things that the IMF doesn't get into. The World Bank gets into that, but the IMF does not. So our problem has been that, 
usually we do, we keep to the conditions relating to stabilizing the economy, mm -hmm. the fiscal measures we've agreed to, the monetary measures, etc. But we don't do enough structural reforms to get ourselves out of this twin deficit hole that we have been, I explained to you the twin deficit problem. So we have to get out of that to be able to get to a situation where we don't have to go to the IMF. Mm -hmm. You know, in Asia, when I was in the central bank, at one point, we were the only country which had an arrangement with the IMF. Of course, this was before the pandemic and sure. all these other shocks that have come in. Only country, right? Asian countries managed their affairs. I mean, earlier during the Asian financial crisis, Korea went, the Philippines went, uh, Thailand went, etc. But since then, the, the Asian countries learned their lesson. They built up their foreign reserves as insurance uh, against shocks and basically have managed their affairs in a way that they don't have to go to the, to the IMF. The only other country which had gone regularly is Pakistan. Mm. And at one point in the time I was there, Mongolia also was there. But what I'm saying is that there, there are many countries in Asia which have never, you know, don't go to the IMF mm -hmm. or may have gone once during the Asian crisis. Yes. But this phenomenon of going again and again is peculiar to us all. We are somewhat, we are mm -hmm. almost unique in Asia. Uh, because of a lack of discipline, you know, if, and the lack of discipline mainly in the government budget. And as I said, and, and, and also preventing the central bank from doing its job in the way it should, have, should be done. So this is a golden opportunity for the government of Sri Lanka to get that discipline instilled, the financial discipline, and then create some freedom uh, for the central bank to operate within its... Uh, and do the structural reforms. And do the structural Which reforms. is what we never do. As I said, so you don't get out of this kind of IMF dependency. We haven't because we don't do the structural reforms. Mm -hmm. You have to do the stabilization, uh, implement the stabilization policy and effect the structural reforms simultaneously, mm -hmm. side by side. Mm -hmm. And I hope this time we will do that. I, I should say one more thing, uh, Rohan, that if we are going to continue to borrow, A, we must make sure that we discipline ourselves and we have to have a primary surplus mm -hmm. in, our, in our budget mm -hmm. and we have to increase our non-debt creating flows, mm -hmm. that is exports, remittances, FDI, etc. Now that is what actually the point that we were trying to make in the time I was in the central bank, we said okay, if you suddenly stop borrowing, you will, it'll be, you'll have a rollover problem, you'll have, mm -hmm. how will you have the money to repay and support mm -hmm. your imports. But there is a, I would encourage everybody to read the medium-term debt management strategy, which was published in, I think, March or April of 2019. That sets out a strategy right. as to how to try to manage our debt. So well, and that's now out of date. It's out of date, but yeah. it, it, you can, one it, can still access it. Yeah, you just bank. Google it. Google you can, it. You, it's on the central bank website. It's on the finance minister website. But you just Google Sri Lanka debt medium-term debt management strategy. March or April 2019. Well, and that at least gives you an idea of some of the issues involved and how you can try to resolve it. Because it became very clear by 2017 or 2018 even that our debt dynamics were very, very vulnerable, mm -hmm. put us in a very vulnerable position. They were very fragile. Uh, and unless we did something, we would end up in the situation we are in today. Right. In fact, I think when I was in the Central Bank, I actually said, if we don't change course, we will end up like Greece. Sadly, we didn't, and now we have ended up there. And, and talking about Greece here, they are still, uh, they are much better than they were five yeah. years ago or ten years ago, but they are still going through that process of change. Yeah. So, so it will take us time. Take us time as well. Yeah, but, but you know, there is a path. There is mm. a path, and I think we've embarked on it. Mm. And I must say, you know, uh, the, the new governor, Dr. Veda Singer, in my view, is doing a very good job. The new, I mean, these are all. For, for, I'm biased, of course, because they are all former colleagues in the I Central see. Bank. Because, yeah. But then uh, you know them first hand. Then, rather yeah. than, uh, my my inner city brother also was in the Central Bank. Right, and they're good people. So uh, that's a good they, team. Yeah. The good team there, and, uh, and and you know the president is very experienced. So I think they they uh, just now need to stick to the technical agenda and, and get it done. I sincerely hope that they can stick to the technical agenda somewhat devoid of popular politics. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we Sri Lankans have had a problem 
the, uh, the politicians have to yeah. uh, respond to it's the not, demands. Yeah, it's not realistic to think that you can take politics completely out of economics. Absolutely. But there are very few countries where politics has dominated economics to the extent it has in Sri Lanka. Mm. I, I don't see. know if there are any, but there are very few. Very few, but uh, again, countries like the United Kingdom, currently we are going through uh, an energy crisis, again, mainly due to the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine with Russia, etc. But then there are ways and means and very effective means of dealing with it because the system works. I think that, that's the important point. Indrajit, we discussed so far the external debt, the foreign debt, uh, and very many thanks for having explained it in, uh, in, in clear detail. Uh, an aspect that we have not spoken about is the what is called the internal debt or the internal debt restructuring. What is that? Could you sort of explain to us what the internal debt is? Because you have explained to us in very clear detail what the external debt and the ramifications are. So what's internal debt? So now our objective now is to make our debt sustainable. Right? Yes. That is what will enable us to, you know, finalize the staff level agreement, get the IMF program to complete our debt restructuring, etc. The whole of that needs to be sustainable. And there is a term called the gross financing needs of the government. Mm -hmm. How much money does the government need in total every year? Right. And that amount should be a sustainable amount. Mm -hmm. So when you are, and, and that usually the IMF has that as one of the targets. In, a, in, a, in any, or, or even the, the, the creditors will look at that. So is the, does the country's projected gross financing needs uh, fall within a, uh, an acceptable uh, uh, target, really? You know, it could be 15%, it could be 12%, it could be 18%, whatever it is. But people should be satisfied that it is, it is something that will be consonant, which will be aligned with that sustainability. So when you look at gross financing needs, you have to look at not only the external debt servicing, but also the domestic debt servicing, because the government has to service both. So to achieve that sustainability, you can try and do it totally on the external debt service, or you can do it on through a mix, mix of the two, or you can through it, or do it only through domestic. Mm -hmm. So there are these three options. So what people like Lazard, the debt advisors, have to be able to advise the government is what is the optimal mix of debt treatment? Mm -hmm. How much do you treat the external debt? How much do you treat the domestic debt? Do you need to do both? Can you just, just do it with one? Etc. So those are the kind of things that are there. And if we are not able to achieve that sustainability by uh, restructuring external debt only, because there is a limit beyond which the yeah. external creditors won't accept, mm -hmm. right, the restructuring. Yeah. So you do as much as possible on the external debt. Because the thing about domestic debt is quite a lot of the domestic debt is held by banks, mm -hmm. uh, EPF, etc., so it's very sensitive. So when yeah. you refer to banks, they are the main banks in Sri Lanka. In, the, in Sri Lanka. Employee Provident Fund. fund like now, yeah. now, you can have, for instance, you have to be careful that the solution is not worse than the problem you're trying to resolve. Mm. Now, if your solution ends up uh, causing a banking crisis, mm. then clearly you end up in a worse position than when you started. So these are the various kind of things that need to be handled. And, and whether in the same way that you would... You know, the, for debt restructuring, there are three modalities. One is you give a haircut on the capital, right? You reduce, you say well, we will pay 70%, 80%, whatever it is, yeah. of, the, of the capital. Two is you modify the interest rates. Mm. And third is a combination of the two. So those are the modalities. And how do you, how are you, uh, sorry, the, the, another, another way of doing it is to stretch out the, Maturity. Extend the period. Yeah. So yeah. you can either cut, cut, so let me do it again, cut the capital, yeah. restructure, you know, reduce the principal amount, stretch out the maturity, mm. modify the uh, interest rate, or you do a combination of the three. I see. 
so that that's something that uh, again uh, not much is discussed or spoken about uh, of on this point however that's something that to bear in mind before we conclude I have another question perhaps uh, I hear or we all hear and uh, see in the press that Japan is willing to convene a creditors conference I know in the 19 mid 50s Sri Lanka or Ceylon uh, at the peace conference spoke highly in favor of Japan I think it was the then finance minister of Ceylon J. R. Jayawardena who made that uh, magnanimous speech in favor of Japan at the Victors Conference. Uh, perhaps it's time now again for us to go to Japan and uh, uh, see what they could do by way of convening a creditors conference. What is likely to happen if there is going to be one in the Okay. Uh, let me also, uh, before I shift on to that, Rohan, on domestic debt, mm. to make very clear from what I understand for, as an outsider looking in, the authorities, Sri Lankan authorities are going to do everything possible not to touch domestic debt. Indeed. Uh, you know, the governor had been clear on this. I think the president is also, uh, I think he's aware of it. So they're going to do absolutely everything possible mm. not to touch domestic debt. Yes. But if it is not possible to get get to debt sustainability without touching domestic debt, to do it in a way that does not upset the banking system uh, or the rights of EPF, etc. So they will they are really focused on minimizing the damage, as I said. Thank you. On answering your question, no. you know, uh, Japan and the, the President Jawadna's speech at San Francisco, etc. You know, I was very skeptical about this. Right. You know, I thought this was with that we used to make a big fuss about this, but that yes. the Japanese probably have totally forgotten. Yes. But then in the 1980s, I was uh, seconded from the central bank to be Ronnie, Mr. Ronnie Dimel, the then uh, finance, finance minister. minister's bag carrier. Mm -hmm. So I used to go all over the world with him. Right. And when we went to Japan, I must say, at that time, President Jayawan was, you know, in office. Every single event, they would start by reference to the San Francisco speech, actually. Yeah. So it is true, you know, the Japanese have not forgotten that. Now, that was many years ago, many years the ago. 80s. Yeah. But I don't think they still have. I, 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 you know, I, I, <laughs> but we have not treated them very well. I know. Recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the recent past. Yeah, in the yeah. recent past. Uh, you know, they were our number one bilateral donor. Mm. Uh, now, and now we have China, etc., which is good. Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, Japan has been our friend, uh, and, and uh, given the right circumstances, I think they will support us. And what they're trying to do now is to provide a platform uh, for the bilateral creditors, the Paris Club creditors, mm. to come together to negotiate. I see. So you need to do that. So it looks as though from the press, it seems they may be willing to take the initiative mm. to create that platform. And, uh, and we need to give China also into it. That, that's the point I was just about to say, because China is sitting outside right at this point in time, outside of the club. But I think if they come in as well, yeah. uh, that would actually be a, a good result for Sri yeah. Lanka. Yeah. On that interesting note, uh, Indrajit, uh, I thank you very much for uh, sharing with us the information that we have been uh, listening to you today and watching. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much for all our viewers. I hope you had a very interesting uh, 30 to 40 minutes of viewing today, brought to you uh, on this program, Connect with Rohandia, with uh, exclusively coming to you through Satyajit Creations from London. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohan.